France was a major tank manufacturer of the 1930s, producing a vast variety of armored vehicle models which went on to battle against the Germans during the 1940 Campaign of France, a crushing French defeat, despite some intense battles and occasional last stands or great feats by French tankers. The mount in which many of these feats were performed is a tank that is very likely the most popular French tank of the war, the mighty, heavily armored and armed B-1 Bis. France's 1940 Tiger. In the first part of a video series on the B-1 Beast, we will cover the vehicle's development history as well as the design of its hull and the powerful 75mm gun that was featured in its hull. As of recently, we have started pumping out more and more videos. While this is good news for you guys, it does mean that our video editors have to put in more and more work in. As such, we are looking for volunteers that are punctual and willing to put out a video at least once a week. If you are interested, just leave a comment or contact us on our public discord which is linked in the description. A major program of French armor through both the 1920s and 30s was the Char du Bataille. From four prototypes presented in 1924, the Char du Bataille FAMH, FCM, SRA, and SRB, the Char de Bataille program evolved towards the B1, of which the first prototype, made of mild steel, was completed by Renault in 1929. At the time, the B-1 was a 25.5 ton vehicle with a hull-mounted 75mm and two turret-mounted machine guns and envisioned to have 40mm of maximum armor. Though this was already considerable for the time, a program calling for an even heavier tank was formulated in October of 1930. Three different designs were presented at paper or mock-up stage. The B-2, weighing 35 tons and 40mm of armor, the B-3 with 45 tons and 50 millimeters of armor, or the hilarious looking BB, 50 tons and 60 millimeters of armor. Though studies on those concepts were continued until 1935, none would end up being adopted or even have a prototype be ordered. While further studies of those vehicles had been abandoned by 1935, the B-1 itself had progressed considerably in the meantime now reaching 27 tons and with a new turret armed with both a 47mm gun and a 7.5mm machine gun, the tank was in the process of entering production. However, its armor protection of 40mm was now proving to be weaker than expected for a breakthrough tank, with newer anti-tank guns expected to be able to penetrate that amount of armor. A solution was needed quite urgently to upgrade the B-1's armor to the standards which have been required to survive the modern battlefield. The solution would be very simple, just thicken the armor of the B-1. As early as 1935, tests of higher weight loads were performed on that first mild steel prototype, which had become somewhat of a mule to experiment on. After finding out that the B-1 was still viable with a higher weight load, thicker plates were added to the design. The front hull went from 40 to 60 millimeters of thickness, with this upgrade requiring some changes, notably to the upper front plate that had to be angled a little differently, at 45 degrees instead of 57. The sides were up-armored to 55mm, the rear was 50mm, and the engine deck was 25. In order to make sure that the tank still moved, a more powerful version of the engine used in the B-1 had to be adopted, and although the design was the same, its power was boosted up to 307 horsepower instead of the previous 270. The turret was another major difference between the B-1 and the B-1 Beast. While the B-1 used the APX-1, the B-1 Beast had the APX-4. While largely based on the APX-1, the APX-4 was, notably, up-armored to 56mm on all sides, from the 40 of the original design, complete with new vision slots. The cupola was up-armored to 48mm and the roof to 30mm. This turret's main armament was the new 47mm SA-35, which offered a higher muzzle velocity and a far better anti-tank performance in comparison to the B-1's SA-34. A number of other changes were also made from the experience gathered with the B-1. The large towing hook mounted to tow the Schneider supply trailers on the B-1 was removed from the B-1 Beast, which used a much smaller hook design. 
The idler wheel's placement was seemingly changed by a few centimeters, being slightly lower and further back. All these changes to the B1 led to the weight rising about 4 tons for a total of 31.5 for the B1Bs. The design process of the B1Bs was straightforward, and a first order of 35 vehicles was placed in October of 1936. This would be enough to equip a battalion and was to be manufactured by a large number of different entities. As stipulated by the STN agreements all the way back in the early 1920s, all manufacturers involved in the development of the Char du Bataille, which was supposed to be a common effort not affiliated to a single company, would receive orders to produce the vehicle. This meant that the four companies involved in the Char du Bataille, Renault, Schneider, FCM, and FAMH saint Simon, would all be producing B1Bs. In addition to those, the newly formed state-owned armor producer of AMX, formed by the nationalization of Renault's design bureau, would receive orders for the tank as well bringing the number of B-1Bs manufacturers to five. The first B-1Bs to be completed, Nth Degree 201, France, would come out of Renault's facilities in February of 1937, several months before the last B-1 was completed by FCM in July of the same year. The B-1Bs' hull was largely retained from the B-1 with a few notable changes. It was quite narrow and elongated because it was designed to cross trenches. The vehicle had a length of 6.35 meters, a width of 2.58 meters, a height of 2.79 meters if you include the turret, and a ground clearance of about half a meter. The tank was 8 centimeters wider than the B1 because of its thicker armor and wider tracks, which were 500 millimeters wide instead of 460 on the B1. The B1 Beast's hull front was composed of 60 millimeter bolted steel plates. Below the driver's post and around the center of the gun mount, it was angled at about 42 degrees. The driver's post itself was angled at 20 degrees, the plate over the gun mount was angled at 60 degrees backwards. The lower plates were angled at about 48 degrees on the side of the driver's post and 32 degrees on the side of the gun mount. And the most notable feature of the whole front, outside of the 75mm gun, was the driver's post. Placed to the vehicle's left, it was a large armored box which stuck out of the general shape of the hull. This post featured a number of vision devices. Two L710 sights for the 75mm SA-35 gun, an adjustable slit fitted with a PPL RX160 episcope on the front, and two vision slits on the sides. The armor plates were 55mm thick on the sides and 50 on the rear. The hull also featured the B1B's radio, able of both receiving and transmitting. It was first a Morse key only ER53, but was replaced through production by a far more modern ER51, able of Morse communication up to 10 kilometers and voice communications up to 2 to 3 kilometers. A crewman was tasked with operating this radio and was also tasked with handling 47mm shells from the hull racks to the commander. This radio was installed on the crew compartment side of the bulkhead which separated it from the engine compartment. A particularly interesting feature of the B1 and B1Bs is that a door existed to enter this engine compartment. It led to a small corridor on the right side of the vehicle which allowed access to the engine and even the transmission and nadir steering system all the way at the back of the hull. The engine used was an upgraded version of the one fitted on the B1, of which the roots go all the way back to the SRA and SRB prototypes of 1924. It produced 307 horsepower from its six cylinders water-cooled petrol engine. The B1's transmission had five forward and one reverse gear. The 35.5 ton B1 Beast was slower than the lighter B1 with 25 km top speed instead of 28. The 400 liter fuel tank arrangement was maintained, which meant that the range was reduced due to the upgraded engine being a little thirstier. Fuel capacity limited the B1Bs to 6 to 8 hours of autonomy in comparison to the 8 to 10 hours in the B1. The maximum range was 160 kilometers in comparison to the 200 it used to be. The gun conspicuously mounted on the B1Bs' hull was a 75 mm short gun, allowed to elevate negative 15 to 25 degrees, but not able to traverse at all. This was unchanged from the B1. The gun itself was a 75mm Model 1929 ABS, also sometimes known as the 75mm SA-35. This gun was designed by the Arsenal des Bourges. The 75mm gun was a short design, only about 17 calibers long. The shells it fired were 75 by 241 rimmed, based on the larger 75 by 350mm shells fired by the 75mm Model 1897, the French Army's standard field gun dating back to World War I. Two shells were standard issue for the 75mm ABS. The first was the Obour de Ripture Model 1910, or burst shell, which was an armored piercing high explosive shell. 
It had a weight of 6.4 kilograms and contained 90 grams of explosives. It was fired at a muzzle velocity of 220 meters per second, and it offered armor penetration of 40 millimeters at an incidence of 30 degrees and a range of 400 meters. Though this was respectable performance by the 1930s, it should be noted that this shell was designed to engage fortifications and not tanks. Because the 75mm in the hull couldn't traverse left or right, it wasn't a good idea to use against armor unless you were at really close range. The other shell was the Obu Explosive Model 1915, a high explosive shell. It weighed 5.5 kilograms and contained 740 grams of explosives, fired at the same muzzle velocity. Sights provided for the 75mm gun were two L710s which formed prismatic binocular sights, and this gave a field of view of 11.5 degrees. Range ladders were provided up to 1600 meters with high explosive and 1560 meters for APHE shells. Two crew members were involved in the operation of the 75mm. To the left of the hull, the driver also assumed the role of the gunner, aiming the gun laterally by literally steering the tank and vertically. Behind the 75mm gun, seemingly sitting on the floor as no seat appears to have been provided, was the loader of the gun. The 75mm shells carried within the hull of the B-1 Beast were in slightly lower numbers than on the B-1, with 74 shells instead of 80. The typical ratio was 7 rupture shells to 67 high explosive. The theoretical rate of fire of the gun was pretty high, at 15 rounds per minute, but within the constraints of an enclosed armored vehicle with a limited crew, that was quite overtasked, and the rate of fire would be closer to 6 rounds per minute with APHE shells and the first 6 HE shells. After that, as the fuses would have to be inserted into the shells for the HE, the rate of fire would decrease to 2 to 4 rounds per minute. The whole armament also featured a 7.5mm MAC-31E machine gun mounted to the right side of the gun, in a fixed mount. The machine gun was invisible from the outside of the tank, and with absolutely no traverse, would have been a weapon of very little use, far more situational and less practical than the coaxial machine gun in the turret. The gun mount of the B-1 Beast's 75mm did not allow a left or right traverse at all, meaning aiming the gun horizontally had to be done by rotating the entire tank itself. This required precise traverse to be possible, and it was assured by a system called the Nader, which had been experimented on from the SRB prototype onward. The Nader used the engine's movement to either suck in or out castor oil heated to 80 degrees Celsius, which was used to traverse the hull with great accuracy. The system was operated by an independent steering wheel at the front, handled by the driver, which transmitted the command to the Nader via a transmission chain. The Nader system had a weight of 400 to 450 kilograms depending on the actual model, and was mounted at the rear of the engine compartment. The Nader was quite a complex piece of machinery, which was expensive and time-consuming to produce. A thousand were ordered in 1935 in order to satisfy the B-1 and B-1 Beasts, but only 633 would be completed by the time France fell. The Nader system was not immune to breakdowns, which could often immobilize the entire tank. At the same time, it provided a very accurate traverse for the era, and its bad reputation may have somewhat been overestimated. While, as most complicated pieces of machinery, the system was indeed vulnerable to breakdowns, it appears that the system was purposefully given a bad reputation by the Ministry of War, which wrongly put out the idea that the Nader was only a temporary solution kept for lack of a better option in order to give the idea that it was inefficient and not worth copying. One of, if arguably the worst issue the Nader had was with crew training and castor oil. The Nader system indeed used castor oil, however, Automotive castor oil was not identical to pharmaceutical castor oil, with the latter being unable to be used properly at 80 degrees Celsius, which meant breakdowns. However, this significant difference between automotive and pharmaceutical oils was not mentioned at any point in the manuals of the B-1 or the B-1 Beast. And while professional crews, which had long time experience with their machines, had usually been informed of the difference, newly formed recruited crews were not. This resulted in many emptying drug stores of their castor oil to put in their B-1 Beast during the Campaign of France, only to have the whole thing break down and take the tank along with it. While medicine heals men, it makes tanks sick. The Nader was also criticized for causing excessive fuel consumption, as it required the engine to be turned on in order to operate. This was particularly an issue with newly formed crews, which were very common in the B-1 Beast, as a large quantity of the vehicles produced had been delivered in the months or weeks preceding the campaign of France, and the very complex tank required some extensive training before it could be operated optimally. 
The B1Bs carried on the hull architecture of the B1, and therefore its elongated hull design and the tracks going around it, optimized not for maximum speed but rather all-terrain and crossing capabilities. The suspension used three large bogies mounted on coil springs, which each contained two smaller bogies with two road wheels. Three independent wheels using leaf springs were featured in the front bogies, and another one at the rear, the purpose of which was track tensioning. A large frontal pulley also assured the track. A large frontal pulley also assured the track was tensioned. This suspension was entirely protected by large side skirts designed to protect it from mud, firearms, and artillery shell splinters. A large central door was featured on the B1B's right side, and this would provide some moderate protection while the crews would evacuate the vehicle, being as thick as the sides of the vehicle at 55 millimeters, though it would not cover the evacuating personnel's legs. The B1Bs used large, welded track links. There were 63 individual links per side, and these were 500 millimeters wide instead of the 460 on the B1. Each of these weighed 18.2 kilograms. The tank had a ground pressure of 13.9 kilograms per square centimeter on solid horizontal soil. The tracks went all around the hull, with large mud guards protecting them at the top. The B1Bs and the B1 were both designed with crossing capacities in mind and it was able to cross a 2.75 meter wide trench or a slope of up to 30 degrees. Vertical obstacles of almost a meter in height and forward over a meter of water without preparation. And that concludes this first video on the B1Bs. You may find a quantity of other articles as well as a complete one on the B1Bs on our website. Ratings, comments, and subscriptions would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. We also have a link to our Discord community server in the description below. If you would like to help us continue and refine our work, also continue donating on our Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.